passage that I read earlier uh, is known as the unity prayer. And it is the prayer that Jesus prayed during probably one of the most difficult and vulnerable moments in his life. Because he had just finished the Last Supper with his disciples and was about to be handed over to the soldiers who would lead him to be tried and eventually executed on a cross. It was the last prayer that the disciples would hear from Jesus before Jesus was led to his death. And so this prayer was a prayer of comfort. And it was a prayer of encouragement to the ones that Jesus trusted to carry out his mission and to preach his message even after his death. So I'm glad that we have this account of Jesus' unity prayer. I ask not on behalf of these, meaning his disciples, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. Now, the disciples then and Christians now have a problem sometimes with this. We have an issue with unity. In 2,000 years, do you think we're any closer to being united, one in Christ? Well, let's think about it. The earliest followers of Jesus in the first century argued over whether new followers had to be circumcised and follow Jewish dietary laws and, and rituals or if they could just be accepted the way they are. Then a few hundred years later, we would argue about the nature of Jesus and the Trinity. And then we argued about what scriptures we should include in the Bible. And if that wasn't enough, a few centuries later, we fought some not-so-holy wars. And then, and then Protestants came around. And we have more denominations now than you can shake a stick at. Even the Stone Campbell Heritage Churches, we, we are a part of these Stone Campbell Heritage Churches, and even we can't keep it together. We have three branches of a movement that started out as a unity movement. Our, our motto was unity is our polar star, if you can believe that. And now we are three different churches. It's like the more time passes, the more rapidly we seem to be losing sight of the idea that we would ever be as one as Jesus prayed for us. And we're still struggling for common ground even today. Can anyone really say that there is a single understanding of who Jesus is? A single Christian understanding of who Jesus is. Or a, sing a single understanding of the Bible. Or the Trinity. And don't forget, there's baptism, Eucharist, and ministry. We covered that last month in church, right? So hey, your pastor preached on it. Does that mean we have it all figured out now? Aww. <laughs> How about social issues? Can we agree on gun control? Can we agree on marriage? Health care issues? Our response to poverty? Economics? What to do with the problem of homelessness? We have different understandings of these things even within our own congregation. Heck, even within our own families. And I'm not talking crazy uncle, crazy cousin families. I'm talking about the people who live under our roof. We have a hard time coming to a, a, an agreement on these things. Uh, not to mention the global body of Christ. So, so then here's the question. What's up? Did Jesus' prayer not get answered? Is this one of those potentially embarrassing moments in the Bible where it looks like a prayer that Jesus himself prayed didn't work? Or 
Is there something else going on here? Well, there's certainly differences and disagreements that are easy to find in the world that we live in. And the sad thing is, is the media is right there shining a big old spotlight on these differences. They even assign colors to these radical differences. You know, like the red states and blue states and orange people and green people and whatever. And a lot of the times these differences get dragged into the church. And then it makes it even more difficult for us to find common ground. A conflict of opinion or even a common controversy, it might create a spark. And that's to be expected, isn't it? The proverb in the Bible, as iron sharpens iron, one person sharpens another. When you do that, it causes sparks. And that's normal. But when you got the media there fanning the flames, all of a sudden you got this big roaring fire. The other morning at breakfast, the worship crew was talking about how it used to be that the news highlighted the occasions where people built consensus. It was, one of, it was one of our core values to bring many people together and come to consensus. It used to be, yes, we can, but anymore it's no compromise. And part of it has to do with the fact that we don't even know how to communicate anymore. We don't know how to place equal value on human relationships and issues because it ends up that the issues seem to always trump human relationships. I was listening to a podcast a few months ago where this veteran senator was lamenting the lack of communication in Washington, D.C. and how nothing seems to have been accomplished in the last couple of years. He says, you know, it used to be that when we came to Washington, we stayed there the whole time we were in session. We didn't have people hopping on commuter planes during the breaks and go out, going out campaigning. We got to know each other. In fact, most of the legislation that happened in Washington did not happen on the floor. We hammered it out in the bars and restaurants afterwards. We discovered that even though we had different solutions to some of the problems our country faced, we could at least agree there was a problem and that something had to be done about those problems. And so we got to know each other and we listened to each other and we found common ground and we found solutions somewhere in the middle. Then when we resumed our work on the floor, we got a lot of things done because we had worked it out the night before. It was all about building relationships. You know, thank goodness we have the Olympic Games every few years because, you know, there's, to be sure, there's competition there. There are rivalries there. Uh, but there's also this core value that even with all of our differences, we can still get together and play games. It's a place where we can see each other as simply human beings. It's a place where excellence and effort are appreciated and applauded. I haven't been keeping up with the Winter Olympics this year, but Barbara Mead was saying that this year it seems like we're more willing to celebrate each other's victories. You know, maybe that's because we are so tired of focusing on our differences. Now, a lot of us have had the privilege of working alongside folks from other church traditions, uh, especially when we serve like at the Jesus Center or the Shalom <coughs> Clinic, or uh, if we're working on a Habitat for Humanity project or going on a mission trip like the Mexico mission trip. It doesn't take long when we're working alongside people from other churches. It does not take long at all to know that there are differences. Um, you know, whether they're sociological differences, theological differences, political differences, whatever. And I am sure that if we talked about our understanding of the Bible, we would also find reasons to disagree. And if we talked about things like evolution or gun control or gay rights, we would have some differences as well. But during that moment that, there, that we are there at that project, there is unity. And it's not a unity founded on what we believed 
about a particular issue. It's not a unity founded on what we believe is good worship. It is not a unity founded on what we believe about the Trinity or baptism or the Lord's Supper. It is found in the simple truth that there is a nail that needs to be hammered into a board. It is a unity founded on the fact that peanut butter must be spread on a piece of bread to make a sandwich. It is founded on the fact that a floor needs to be cleaned or, or a, a fence post hole needs to be dug. It is a unity founded on the fact that people need our help. And if you haven't figured it out by the bulletin cover and the inserts and such like that, or Kathy's uh, children's moment, this is the beginning of our week of compassion. Now, if you're not familiar with our church, that doesn't mean that we lack compassion for 51 weeks of the year. And now all of a sudden we're going to be compassionate. What it is, uh, it's actually the name of our denomination's global relief ministry. And this is how it works. Wherever and whenever a disaster strikes anywhere in the world, whether it's natural or human-made, Week of Compassion is there to help. Uh, maybe it involves providing emergency shelter or emergency funds to help clean up after like a tornado in Oklahoma or providing food and fresh water to a famine-stricken region in Africa or maybe uh, a refugee resettlement for people who are in a war-torn country like Syria. No disaster goes unnoticed by Week of Compassion. And I tell you, Week of Compassion tackles the big ones, like Hurricane Katrina back in 2005. It was the costliest natural disaster our country had ever seen. And there they were. There they were. They are still having mission trips down in the Gulf uh, cleaning up after Katrina. But you know, they also tackle the small stuff too. Because in 1996, this torrential rainstorm hit Parisburg, Virginia. And there was so much rain, there was like seven, eight inches in an hour. And it caused this big old cascade of water to come off a mountain, Angel's Rest. And uh, it, <laughs> there was only one house in that whole town that suffered significant damage during that storm. And it just happened to belong to a member of First Christian Church in Parisburg. The water collapsed a wall of this woman's basement and it just made an awful mess. And Week of Compassion had a check in the mail within the week to help cover that damage. So even though Week of Compassion is a ministry of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, we also partner with many different churches to help other people in need. We don't let differences in belief become a barrier when it comes to people needing help. So back to that question about the effectiveness of Jesus' unity prayer. You know, maybe it's just time to give up on the idea of all believing the same things. Because life and culture and traditions, heck, even human beings, people in general, are complicated. Now, beliefs are important. Do not get me wrong. Beliefs are important because they help shape who we are. And what we do. But we too often let beliefs become barriers when they really don't need to be. The unity of the body of Christ is seen most clearly, most passionately, and most convincingly in the servant love that we share with one another and with the world. Beliefs and theological conversations, they do matter. But nothing shows Jesus' love like a group of people who love their neighbor with action, enthusiasm, and purpose. As individuals and congregations, may we be about the same business. To love as Jesus loved, to serve as Jesus served, and to be one in these ways so that God's glory may be revealed in and through us. Will you pray with me?
God, we thank you for our differences. And we are also sorry for those times when those differences create barriers between us. Because we know that when we create barriers between each other, ultimately, we are creating a barrier with our relationship with you. So Lord, may your spirit, which united the disciples, maybe for only uh, moments at a time, be with us. May we love as you have loved us, and may we serve as Jesus served all. These things we lift up in Christ's name. Amen.